All right. So to start off, we're going to do a few housekeeping items. Please keep yourself on mute for the whole presentation. We have so much to cover today. We have so much content and some brilliant panelists here with us. We will be recording the event and posting it online afterwards. We'll follow up with an email um, with the link to that video, plus possibly a Q&A afterwards if we don't have time to go over a Q&A. For questions, please put them in the chat. Nicole Reeve Parker is here and will be um, answering questions in the chat or at least accumulating them um, so that we can answer them in a Q&A. If you have a sensitive question or you'd like to privately uh, send a message to someone, Nicole can accept your private message so you can have privacy with that question. Like I said, if time permits, we will have Q&A at the end of the panel. Um, but with all of the wonderful content that we've been going over, I don't know that that will happen. Just don't worry, we will send out a Q&A doc afterwards um, with the link for the recording. Before we, we begin, we do want to acknowledge that we live and work on the traditional territories of the Duwamish and Coastal Salish peoples, and that we occupy this land. While we recognize that this acknowledgement does not replace authentic relationships with indigenous communities, we hope that it honors with gratitude the land and the original inhabitants. Also today, we'd like to introduce CART. We are having communication access real translation performed on this event. Um, Ian, did you want to talk about this a little bit in depth? Ian is our manager of disability services or, um, office and is the one that organizes these events. Yes, service, thank say. you very much. And I'll give a full introduction in a later slide, but this is Ian Campbell, manager of the Disability Services Office. Um, I just wanted to um, say a word about CART. Um, CART is really um, essential to creating inclusive programs through universal design. Uh, it assists individuals with hearing-related disabilities, uh, auditory processing disorders, and learning disabilities, as well as it grants better access for English as a second language learners. And we've all been in environments such as airports or hospitals where um, there are acoustical challenges and we wanna tune into a program on the screen and captioning is, um, is critical to being able to do so. Um, just a little bit about, um, uh, let's see here, Patricia, thank you for providing services today. Um, Patricia is our, our CART um, captioner. Um, so uh, these individuals are live stenographers. Um, they usually start off as courtroom stenographers. Um, they, they use specialized software um, to capture um, auditory um, uh, aspects of a program and provide a word-for-word -word transcript. Uh, they usually require prep materials ahead of time, create a specialized vocabulary in, in order to provide um, an accurate work product. Uh, these individuals are in very high demand, and um, they're very important to us at the university. And um, if um, folks are interested in providing captioning services at one of their events, um, you can contact the Disability Services Office um, at our web at um, our general email address at dso at uw.edu. Thanks, Ian. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our amazing panelists. Thank you so much for being here today. Let's go ahead and start with Ashley. Can you introduce yourself? Sure, hey y'all. My name is Ashley. I use she, her pronouns. And I um, am a white woman with long black hair um, and blurry background, nothing, nothing cool. Um, so a little bit about why I'm here. I'm the CEO and founder of Crip Riot, which is a local disability pride and media organization uh, built by a lot of disabled alum. Um, and we also, I'm also a UW grad myself, um, which is very, very cool uh, to be doing that work. I am uh, mad mentally ill identifying, so I prefer uh, identity first language. And so that means, and I'll talk a little bit about what that means later, but I identify as neurodivergent and uh, chronically ill as well. So excited to, to be here um, 
on this panel. Oh, and one other thing, I also do human resource consulting and consulting with small mid-range businesses. So it's a kind of a unique range of perspective and just, yeah, very excited to have the dialogue. Thank you, Ashley. And Christine. Hi, everybody. My name is Christine. I use she, her pronouns to give a brief image description of myself. I am an Asian American woman with long brown hair, um, and I'm wearing a white kind of multicolored top um, button down with a blurry background. Um, yeah, to give a little bit of background on myself, I am relatively newly neurodivergent identifying. Um, I don't think I've ever said that in a public event before, so yay, that's exciting. I am disabled identifying. I'm also a CODA, child of deaf adults. Um, I currently work as the program operations specialist for disability resources for students from DRS on the UW campus. I graduated with my bachelor's from UW last year, spring 2021, um, psychology and disability studies. I'm also um, one of the co-founders and currently working for the companies that Ashley had mentioned, Crip Riot, and uh, doing HR consulting work as well. Um, I worked in the ASUW Student Disability Commission for a couple of years in my undergrad and was very heavily involved in the disability justice work on the student side and am now in the staff side. Um, yeah. Thank you, Christine. Ian, would you like to introduce yourself? And you're on mute, just so you know. Hello, everyone. Um, this is Ian Campbell. I use uh, he, him pronouns. Uh, I am a white male with brown hair, a brown beard, uh, wearing a bluish green button up shirt. And I am coming to you from my office in Roosevelt Commons West. Um, I manage the Disability Services Office for UW Human Resources. Uh, we provide a number of different leadership uh, uh, functions for the university. For the purposes of this conversation, um, we are one of the primary administrators of the disability employment accommodation process at the university. Um, I've had a number of different um, uh, professional opportunities um, to work um, around um, neurodiverse uh, populations. Uh, I supervised a program supporting uh, university students at Central Washington University um, with uh, on the autism spectrum disorder uh, as well. Um, I uh, started my career as an ADHD coach, um, so coaching individuals who had sort of executive functioning um, uh, issues. Um, my personal experience, um, which I, maybe I'm most proud of, I had the opportunity to coach the Kittitas County Cougars Special Olympics basketball team um, years ago, and we had a second place finish in the regional championship, and the majority of our, of our team um, was neurodiverse. Um, as well, I have a 17-year-old son who um, has, um, uh, is neurodivergent. And at the age of 17, um, he has his high school equivalency and is taking classes at Seattle Central Community College. So. Thank you so much, Ian. Sure. And Kels. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kels Rizzo. My pronouns are they, them. Um, I am a fat, queer, uh, neurodivergent person with uh, short brown hair uh, shaved on the sides. I'm wearing a light blue shirt and have a purple wall background because uh, I am in the D Center today, the Disability Center here on campus in the hub uh, where I work as a, a student. Um, a student coordinator. And I'm also the um, public policy intern for the Student Disability Commission within ASU Dub. Um, and I won't list my all of my disability identities, um, but primarily for the purposes of this conversation, I am dyslexic, ADHD, and autistic. Thank you, Kels. Lucas, Dr. Harrington. Hello, uh, I am Lucas Harrington. I'm a clinical psychologist at the University of Washington Autism Center. Um, image description, I am a mostly white appearing white and Japanese mixed race uh, person with 
shortish brown hair and a blue button up shirt. Um, I am, you know, have experience both as a professional providing a lot of services for autistic people and other neurodivergent people and also receiving accommodations as um, a, as you UW employee, I am, I have, I'm autistic, I have ADHD, I have Tourette syndrome, I have physical disabilities, um, and mental health disabilities. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much to our panelists for being here. Um, we're going to head into a definitions and terminology section to really kind of level set with all of us. I know that I personally am pre preparing for this, got a lot of these terms wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and so I appreciate the panelists providing insight into this. I'll read the descriptions and I hope the panelists will provide input um, and extra details to these descriptions. So neurodiversity describes the idea that people experience and interact with the world around them in many different ways. Anything to add panelists? Yeah, I would just add for the context of um, the workplace, uh, pretty much every workplace is neurodiverse in that there's a combination of people who are neurotypical and people who are neurodivergent. Um, and so really any conversation uh, like the one we're having here where there's a few of us who are neurodivergent identified and a few who are neurotypical identified, that means that it's a neurodiverse conversation. Uh, and, I'll, I'll, and I'll also add, I think uh, neurodiversity is often used as a shorthand for a number of things. Um, but if you want to kind of get fine grained about it, you know, neurodiversity is the general idea that just diversity exists, you know, the same as religious diversity or uh, racial diversity and so on. And then um, there are things like the neurodiversity paradigm or the neurodiversity movement, which are more of these political efforts to say not only does neurodiversity exist, but it's also a good and natural thing and provides us with important opportunities to learn from each other, just like any other kind of diversity. Great. Neurotypical. Neurotypical is a descriptor that refers to someone who has the brain functions, behaviors, and processing considered standard or typical. Um, Dr. Harrington Lucas, you wanted to add to that quote, and that's according to cultural norms and uh, social role expectations. So that you might want to speak to that a little bit. Yeah, you know, basically what's considered standard or typical is going to vary widely depending on what culture you're in. There's going to be lots of different expectations depending on what your role within a culture is, um, you know, expectations for girls growing up are often going to be very different from expectations for boys or, you know, more likely expectations based on the assigned gender. Um, and I would also like to add that, you know, neurotypical is not one single thing where everybody performs at the exact same level. There's, you know, virtually everybody has some degree of variability where they're stronger in some areas and not as strong in other areas. But if you're neurotypical, then that variation is not falling outside of what we what we kind of think of as normal variation. Like you might get somebody where they're like, okay, yeah, math is a little challenging for me, but maybe it's not reaching the level of a disability where they're going to need accommodation. Whereas neurodivergent usually means that your experience is falling outside of the norm of what's going to be supported in an environment where everybody assumes that you fit these norms. Thank you, Lucas. Any other panelists want to add anything to this definition? Thank you. All right, neurodivergence. Uh, neurodivergence is the term for people whose brains function differently in one or more ways than is considered standard or typical. Uh, common neurodivergence include autism, ADHD, dyslexia, and bipolar disorder. Any additions from the panelists? I'll add that with, and panelists feel free to to correct me if you have other ideas on this, but I think that within neurodivergence, there are even kind of subcategories of identity. So uh, you've got folks that identify maybe as autistic, or you've got folks that identify as mad or mentally ill, or as a person with mental illness. The point is that 
there are many people who identify as neurodivergent who may also have other neurodivergent related identities depending on what their contexts are. Yeah, and I, I think just what I would add to that is, um, thank you, Ashley, for, for that, is uh, it's like many disabilities, something that can, it's not necessarily something that you're born with. It is, a, our brains are changing, right? And it's something that um, even things like, um, like trauma can show up similarly as, um, as these traits. So uh, as traits from, from these other types that we see listed here. So um, it's, it's not necessarily something that you think of as being like a, um, an inherited or genealogical um, requirement in order to be neurodivergent. And I think we'll probably dive into this more later, but I also wanna add um, that none of these being neurodivergent is not require a piece of paper from a doctor that says you are neurodivergent. There are so many different levels of privilege that comes along with being able to access that type of diagnosis. And many of those types of diagnoses are extremely expensive, um, even for people who have insurance or have access to that. Um, and so people who self-identify as neurodivergent are just as valid as anybody who does have that medical diagnosis. And I will, I will back that up as a person who does autism evaluations and does those formal diagnoses. Um, it is extremely rare for me to see someone self-identify and I am not sure that I agree with them. It is, you know, for every person I see where they've self-diagnosed and I'm, I'm not sure I agree you know, I'm probably seeing 20 or 30 people in my professional personal life where I agree that their self-diagnosis is correct, but they're having trouble getting other people to take them seriously. So I put a lot of, I, I put a lot of weight in as, as somebody who does these formal evaluations, I strongly endorse uh, self self-diagnosis for the reasons that you're saying. All right, well, this is already turning into a rich conversation, so I'm gonna try to get um, through these definitions so we can get onto the, the questions, uh, but really important. And Ashley, I'm hoping you'll speak to this. Uh, people first language or identity community language. This is something that I trip up on all the time. So it, this is gonna be really illuminating for me and hopefully for our group too. Yeah, so I think a lot of times we get taught only use person first language. It was something that I even came into the disability studies program and that was you know, the prevailing narrative. But among disabled people, there is a growing movement to use identity or community first language because it's a, it's a way of kind of center, centering that part of yourself. Uh, I think that when we kind of emphasize this person with a disability, it's I'm not my disability. But for a lot of people who have a disability, it shapes our experiences. It's a huge part of our lives. And so the community we're seeing, and, and every community is different in terms of whether or not they, they tend to prefer one identity versus another. I know there are a lot of people that maybe prefer person with a mental illness over identifying as a mentally ill person. I personally prefer identity first. Um, so it's just kind of a, a, some food for thought in terms of how do you within your own identities, what do you prefer? And how have these identities shaped your contexts and experiences? Um, and, and Ashley, for those of us who care about or work with folks, um, what is the best way to learn about how they prefer to be referred to? It's not a bad idea to, to ask, should they, um, you know, should you want to understand what people prefer and then want to, to try and um, make sure that we're being thoughtful. There's no wrong way to identify in this context. So definitely I, there are some great memes out there about um, neurotypical people policing the language of neurodivergent people. Uh, so don't do that. Don't be that person. Recognize that there's a lot of diversity even in terms of how people prefer to identify and it's a very personal thing. Great, thank you. This definition um, is internalized ableism. Uh, internalized ableism is when a person consciously or unconsciously believes in the harmful messages um, that they've heard uh, about disability and applies them to themselves. 
don't know if I the will, panelists want to add anything. I, I will add in sometimes that also gets applied to other people. Sometimes you see sometimes something you see with internalized ableism sometimes is people trying to position themselves as, well, I'm one of the good ones. I'm not like those other disabled people and trying to distance themselves from people that they they do see as fitting the more harmful stereotypes. And so um, you know, just people people buying into these negative messages about disability does causes a lot of strife both for themselves and in their relationship to their community. All right, and this, Ashley, we're hoping to, to have you speak to this too, because it's not, there's not a clear um, difference between mentally ill and neurodivergent. It seems like there's a lot of crossover. Um, so I was hoping that you could speak to this, like what's mad, what's mentally ill, um, and, and how is that different than neurodivergent? How is it the same? Yeah, I can mostly, it's different. So it's, these are identities. So I'm going to suggest that everybody comes to it differently, but I can kind of share my story in terms of how I came to identify the way that I did. So part of the reason I identify as neurodivergent is that prior to ever being diagnosed with a mental illness, I was a very neurodivergent child, meaning I was, I did not engage within social norms. I was very weird and ostracized for it. Um, and so I kind of came to my neurodivergent identity in reflection on my journey through uh, being neurodivergent. When I was in high school is when I first started uh, showing signs of mental illness. And I ended up going through the medical system. And that's part of the reason that I identify as mentally ill is that I went, I had all these experiences of being institutionalized and interacting with the medical system in relation to my own experiences. But mad is a mad is a is a term that I actually hold very near and dear to my heart. Uh, madness is kind of a social categorization and it's a reclaimed term used by um, a great number and a growing number of people in uh, mad pride and disability justice spaces. Part of the reason for that is that um, I have many, many diagnoses, a very long list of things that I've been diagnosed with over time. As I go through different clinical providers, they get taken away, they get added, they have this perspective. And often medical providers are kind of viewed as the arbiter of whether or not, you know, of what you are and what you have. And so what I appreciate about madness is it doesn't matter what the, what a medical provider says. My mad identity really comes from my, my experience with the system. It's, uh, it's relates to my experience with my community and it is a way of, uh, suggesting that my madness exists independent of the medical system. Uh, I will also add that the, um, Oh, I had a great thought on this, um, but I'm having a neurodivergent moment, <laughs> so I might come back to it later. Um, but that's anybody else got anything they want to add? I'll add that these are overlapping but not identical groups. Um, there's, you know, a lot of mental illness is a form of neurodivergence because it's a way in which your brain is operating differently from other people. Being neurodivergent, having autism or ADHD, those are not mental illnesses. They often come with mental illnesses attached, probably in large part because of the oppression that we're experiencing, just like any other minority is often at risk for increased risk for mental illness because life is damaging in many ways and difficult, um, but autism is not inherent, autism, ADHD, those kinds of diagnoses are not inherently mental illnesses in themselves. Thank you. All right, so into our questions. The first question, and um, I hope the panel saw. Oh, there's, there's a question in the chat here that I think is relevant to this last um, right. discussion here that is as a reclaimed term, how should those who are outside the MAD identity engage with that term? I'm happy to, to say at least kind of where I'm at with it. Um, there's nothing wrong with MAD identity. There's nothing, it doesn't need to be this weird thing that we tiptoe around. It really is a personal preference and there's a lot of amazing things that MAD pride activists are doing. Um, so, I mean, don't, don't go saying if somebody hasn't identified as mad, don't go saying that they are mad. I guess that seems like a given, but, um, you know, definitely try to, to recognize that it is, that reclaimed language has a lot of power within the community and it's a totally valid way to identify. Yeah, I think if you're going to use it, 
outside of the context of somebody has self-identified um, provide this framework to other folks that you are talking with so that they can also understand that you're not using it as a weapon but as a way of honoring somebody's identity and normalizing that. Thank you for pointing that out, Kels. All right, on to our first question. What does neurodiversity look like in the workplace? If it's all right with the other panelists, I'd like to kind of kick this off. Um, it can look like a lot of things, but I wanted to kind of put it, some of it in the context. Yeah, somebody just put it in the chat too, feeling like a target. Um, so I wanted to unpack that just a little bit also within the context of the University of Washington. Um, so, and also I, I used to be a manager. This is, I'm a second career student. I worked in property management um, for almost 20 years, as well as campaigns um, and at other, sorts of uh, social activism spaces. So uh, they were all very neurodiverse environments, but I think let's let's dial it back to um, one of the things that uh, President Kause presented to the Senate in winter quarter was a diversity and hiring report. And it had gone up from the previous year of people who had been hired within the university from 2.3% to 3.6%. And granted, I don't know how often that is, that's a, that might be people who at the beginning of the hiring process are deciding to self-identify. I believe that was the context. So not necessarily people who are already existing within the UW community as workers. Um, but I, I think that that number in a state where one in five people is disa disabled identifying, that's a really skewed number, right? And a lot of that comes with that fear of being targeted. So just to put this into context a little bit, um, this is a story I heard from another dyslexic friend. This is not my experience, but I have their consent to share this experience. Um, I actually figured out I was dyslexic a week before fall quarter started through accommodations I was getting through DRS. And they showed me a, a text button that put it into a dyslexic style font. And it was like putting on glasses. I could, I could actually read for the first time uh, without losing my place every other second or just the page turning into a word soup. And that's how I learned that there's four different types of dyslexia um, that are, are most dominant, which we typically only talk about or identify one. And um, so there's some great resources on that. We'll share that later, but I just wanna come back to the point here about like the, the feeling of safety in disclosing. Um, so this friend of mine who's been dyslexic and was fortunate enough to be identified as dyslexic at a young age, when they first went into workspaces, they would let their manager know, hey, I'm, I'm dyslexic. And um, that's kind of where the conversation would stop because people were afraid to ask questions that would, um, that would, potentially get them in trouble, right? And there was this kind of assumption of, oh, well, I know what dyslexic is. Okay, send me your emails first and I'll have a look over them before you send them out. And so already we're getting into a micromanaging territory, right? Because we've defined professionalism as having this like perfect grammar and spelling in written communications. So now this dyslexic person has additional labor that they're taking on to send out a second email um, with corrections and having to redo this work. And the manager thinks that they're being helpful, right? They're like, oh, if you're dyslexic, you don't know, so I will correct this for you. And, and then over time, resentments can start to build up, right? It's like, gosh, is this person really worth all of this additional labor in figuring out what whether or not this is, is worded properly and I'm being pulled away from these things? And we can start to tell ourselves stories, right? So then at this time, like when this happens often enough, you do kind of get targeted because you're getting extra special attention and you're about things that you're not good at. And that makes most people reduce confidence, right? And start second guessing themselves. So their performance starts to suffer. So after this happens a number of times, you stop disclosing, right? You just show up and try to muscle through the best you can. Um, and 
and so it's it's always the the person who's having to figure out how to advocate for themselves within whatever institution and team they're a part of not knowing this this new manager this new group whether the hr department is even going to know what accommodations could look like so if you don't even know that you're dyslexic like me you just think that everything takes you longer right like i was able to start being so much easier on myself once i realized that i'm not it's not that i'm stupid or it's not that other people make it look easier but it's actually just as hard for them that's sometimes the case it's that it actually does take me longer. It takes my brain longer to understand things and process things. So maybe it's not like, can, can we just kind of put in a tagline in my email that says, please excuse any misspellings or grammar mistakes. I'm dyslexic if I'm comfortable doing that. And we all just agree to move on with our lives so I can just send the email. Like I've heard of that happening, but you also as the individual who needs the accommodation need to know what your accommodations look like, what is legal for you to ask for, and also what is like, do I have the relationship to be able to ask for this beyond ADA, or am I gonna get this target on my back? And that's in every institution we interact with. It's education, it's healthcare, it's our workplaces, right? It's also our relationships. So it's exhausting. <laughs> it's really, really exhausting. And um, that can jump to defensiveness really quickly, too. So um, it can look like a lot of things. And it's but it's usually resulting in the individual versus the institution is the dynamic that ends up playing out. And really what we can think about is because there's not access to testing, because not everybody has access to all of these resources, how can we just make our workplaces more inclusive? I'd love to, to build off of that. Uh, thank you, Kels. Um, and Christine, I'd actually love, because Christine and I had the opportunity to work together in the Student Disability Commission uh, during my second term back in undergrad. And so she's actually got a really interesting take on my experience. And so I want to share a little bit about kind of the some of the things that come from having a neurodiverse workplace and some of the potential benefits of that. So I was going to the University of Washington and I needed remote access. I had, at this point, uh, I had both a combination of depression and a new chronic illness that resulted in making it just very difficult to get to campus, whether for class or for work. And when Christine came on board, she was generally the person that was in person in the office. And this was before ASUW, the student uh, government did any type of remote work. So, you know, there I was doing a lot of work remote. And uh, because of that, the office for the Student Disability Commission was working hybrid before COVID. And as a result, and under Christine's amazing direction, they were the only student government entity that still did student programming reliably during once COVID hit. And the same thing happened with my previous employer. I had moved all of their onboarding documentation remote because that's what I needed. And sure enough, COVID hits and we don't miss a beat because we're already remote. So this is kind of what can come from neurodiversity and people that think differently or operate differently. It actually can have really profound benefits to an organization, but that doesn't mean that we don't enter these spaces and get shut down and told that we, have, we don't deserve to be there or get excluded, which is part of where I would love for Christine to give a take on some of what she witnessed when she was working with me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love talking about this experience, especially with Ashley. Um, and I'll note that I have very fond memories of prior to COVID making Google Doc pro cons lists on which types of remote meeting software would be the, the best and looking at Zoom and going, ah, I don't know if we can afford that with our budget. And then the entire university buying Zoom for everybody. Look at us. Wow, we've come so far. Um, the experience that I was having, I would come into the office often and would be there most days and Ashley would be working with me, but through Slack and I would be, you know, slacking her or Slack being the um, sort of teams, but it's a different format, different platform in case you're not familiar, um, business messaging type of platform. And she would be on Slack and someone would come in, ASU Dub president, ASU Dub vice president, one of the other commission directors, somebody would come into the office and say, hey, where's Ashley at? I had a question for her. I need to collaborate with her on this thing. And I would respond, oh, Ashley's working right now. She's actually on Slack, just send her a message. 
And then I would touch base with Ashley a couple hours later to learn that the person never reached out. And this happened consistently all the time. Um, and there was this unspoken expectation that if you are not working in person, somehow you are not working. You are not available. You are not able to collaborate, not able to participate. Um, and this is transformed dramatically with COVID. And we, we see that in a lot of our departments and programs. And yet at the same time, there is still this very strong push back to being in person. And that is really hard for a lot of neuro neurodivergent, mad slash mentally ill, all of disability, all of those different types of identities and experiences. It can be really difficult um, for a lot of people. And that can also, you know, we're, there's a huge retention problem right now. Many people are leaving the university. I wonder why, <laughs> like we're, we're coming back in person and that may not be accessible for everybody. And I think this echoes back on what Kels was saying as well in terms of professionalism and in terms of what does it mean to work? For those of you who are listening, who are managers, who you know supervise a team, maybe you're supervising multiple entities, maybe you're pretty high up in UW administration, you're making a lot of these decisions. I really implore you to take a very, solid look at your own understanding of professionalism, your own understanding of work and productivity and flip it on its head entirely and, and really get to understand what is the core of what are we doing? What are we trying to accomplish? And can we accomplish it in different ways? Because you actually will probably make your staff members much happier, much healthier, and feel much more supported if we have that greater level of flexibility. Not only just remote work, but also like for me and my neurodivergent identity, I work better during certain times of the day. Um, and those are not always eight to five. Uh, you might catch an email from me that is sent at 11 p.m. Sorry, I work great at 11 p.m. And there's a tagline in my email that says, you know, if you receive this outside of your business hours, don't feel any pressure to respond. It's just how I work. And that has never been, um, I've never gotten any pushback for that. And I feel very grateful for that. But I do, there's a lot of workplaces that would consider that non, not professional. Um, and that goes back to, you know, whose work style are you prioritizing the most? Um, I feel like we're also bleeding into a lot of different answers for different questions that we're about to go into. So I wanna make sure that we are somewhat still on this question. Um, Lucas or Ian, was there more you wanted to add for this question? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to comment real quickly. Um, first of all, I, I want to really compliment everyone, um, especially Kels, your comments really stood out to me about just highlighting the challenges in the workplace, as well as sort of challenges or limitations around the employment accommodations process. And as an administrator of that process, I recognize those limitations. Um, you know, uh, I can say that at the university, you know, because people have chosen to disclose and request accommodations, there are, are really high level administrators and incredibly productive researchers that would, you know, qualify as, as neurodivergent that just contribute so much to the university community. It's like at the end of the year, when we look back on the university's highlights for the year, I mean, there's so many productive, incredible contributions coming out of this group that we're talking about today. It's, it's really phenomenal. Um, the other thing that I'd like to comment on is sort of from a best practices in, uh, in employment accommodation for managers out there that may be listening right now. Uh, if someone comes to you and discloses, I'm, I'm having a difficult time with this job function, um, I would recommend that you not assume you know, you not assume that this person, you know, has a disability or is neurodivergent, and I wouldn't assume what they need. I would simply ask, how can I help you? Just, just that simple. Is there anything that I can do to help you? And allow that person to choose to disclose or not disclose or request accommodation or disclose and not request accommodation. Um, but let, let the individual drive the conversation um, and, and as well, um, you know, if someone does disclose, I would recommend that you, you know, just reference the, the, the disability services office website and, and allow them to seek services should they choose to do so. Thank you. That was so inform much information from that one question. So I'm gonna I'm gonna move on to the next question. Unless uh, Lucas, did you want to add anything to what the other panelists have said? And you're on the mute, by the way. Um, no, I'll I'll get us started with the next with the next Great. slide. Perfect. Thank you. 
Um, all right, how does bringing together folks with different neurotypes strengthen our teams and organization? And Ian kind of spoke to this already about the amazing folks in our community who are neurodivergent, um, producing amazing projects and, and work. So wh what, else, what else can we know about, about this? Yeah, so there was a great study that was looking at, not neurodiversity specifically, looking at diversity in general, but they were looking at groups that had people who had many different perspectives, I believe because of gender or race or what have you. And they found that the people's decision-making felt less efficient because people weren't just all getting in agreement and moving along quickly, but they were making better decisions. Um, and I have this illustration that I use when I present on this topic, talking about how, um, you know, basically autistic people and neurotypical people often approach concepts from very different directions. So neurotypical people are often very kind of big picture, vague outline first, and then filling in details. And autistic people are often starting with the details and then building out. So I have this illustration where it's a picture of a cheetah and talking about how, you know, if you only have partial information, then each side thinks the other side is being ridiculous because, you know, the neurotypical person is getting the general gist. So they have partial information. They're going, oh, it's some kind of furry animal, like maybe a wolf or a bear. And the autistic person might just be getting, you know, patches of color. So they're going, oh, it's yellow and black. Maybe it's a wasp. Maybe it's a bus. And then the one side is going, are you kidding? A bus? It's an animal. And the other side is going, a bear? It's yellow and black. You know, what's wrong with you? And so when you get something where everybody can understand it, and everybody can see that it's right, that tells you you've probably hit on the correct solution here. Thank you, Lucas. I'll, I'll comment as well. Um, I mean, I think there's so many different anecdotal and data-driven arguments that show that neurodiverse populations have in incredible strengths, unique, incredible strengths that they can bring to the workplace. And, uh, you know, for managers out there who are maybe interested in, in better utilizing those incredible strengths, um, strength-based leadership is a practice that, um, that I've, I've studied in the past that I find very valuable. And it's all about learning how to bring your teams together in a complementary way in order to utilize individual strengths. And um, yeah, I, I would recommend looking into strength-based leadership. Do any other panelists want to speak to this question? All right, moving on. Next question. What do you wish neurotypical colleagues knew about being neurodivergent? You see a sigh from Kels, this is a big question. It is a really big question. And I think um, one of the things that comes up for me as I am looking at this is um, it, so much of it is about regulation, right? And it's not just regulating behavior, it's, it's body temperature regulation, it's um, hormonal regulation, it's, uh, how much of my brain do I have at my disposal at this time of day to be able to be focused and thoughtful? Um, and so it, it's not even the kind of thing where it's like, once you figure it out, it's the same all the time. It, it change, your, the needs change. And so um, there are certain types of assignments where like, I, I need noise canceling headphones and I need to not be interrupted. And if people interrupt me, then especially if they are demanding, they're not gonna get the kindest face from me. They're gonna get my actual face of, oh God, I just completely lost everything that I was working on. And I learned how to be like better communicate about that, like rather than just coming in and starting to talk, give me a knock, knock, do you got a sec? And I would say, give me one second to finish my thought so I could finish my sentence and be done. Or can you give me five minutes, right? And so um, it's, 
it's a lot of um, consideration that requires extra steps that like none of us are perfect at. So just, I think it's really just like, please, please give everybody a break. We're all doing the best we can at any given time. And some days our best isn't the best that it was the day before when you as a manager really need that because you're getting pressure for something. But yeah, it's just, it's not, it's not always consistent. And most of us really wish that it could be. Yeah, I'll also add to that, that I, and I kind of want to direct this to managers a little bit. We have got to consider having diverse teams, a value and, a, and, and also a measurement of what it means to be a good manager. That, and that includes neurodiversity. And that means thinking about, you know, how am I setting the tone for the culture in this space? How am I setting the tone for what normal is and what's expected? And I think a lot of times, because we're not, you know, because the system is set up such that management means that, you know, you're, I don't want to say writing people's asses, but I don't really have a better phrase for it, that there's this conception that that's what it looks like. And I think that that's not, that's not really about having a diverse team that can work collaboratively. So a big part of this is, is understanding your own role and maintaining that power structure and, and really reconceptualizing that and seeing the humanity in your team and trying to create a space where, you know, diverse people can come together and, and thrive. And I'd, I'd like to add in, I see someone in the chat is commenting that they actually have a completely different reaction to interruptions where once somebody's already started, then they just want it to go as quickly as possible. They don't want to lead in. And so, um, you know, that ties into something that I uh, like to talk about, which is you don't want to come in assuming what neurodivergent people need. Um, I mean, even when you come in assuming what neurotypical people need, you're often going to be wrong because their individual circumstances are unique. Um, and so one of the things that I suggest is basically treating it like, you know, imagine that you, that your colleague who, especially if they're autistic, but also other kinds of neurodivergent is from a different cultural background from you. So just throw out all of your assumptions about these shared understandings that you're supposed to have and instead come in, you know, getting curious about what is their world like, you know, what's important to them? What was their intention when they did that thing that was surprising to you? And really like I've always found that I'm often happiest in multicultural environments where it's going to be assumed that everybody is going to communicate what they mean and make sure that they're understood instead of assuming that everybody else can fill in the gaps because of this shared background. I'll, I'll, I'll come on, comment on one more thing just quickly. Um, one, I think check, check your biases at the door and like, like Lucas said, come in curious, open-minded and you know, learn and grow. Um, I think the other thing is, is around communication. Um, I would recommend that people communicate very directly. Um, you know, indirect communication or hinting at something or anecdotal communication, um, that, that's not, you know, th that's, that's not the best way to communicate with all populations. So I would recommend really working on just very direct communications. Say exactly what you want to say um, without inferring that they are understanding what you mean. And I think I know we're running out of time here and I wanna keep this quick, um, but the last thing I wanna say too is that you're gonna get stuff wrong. And that's with every single you know, adjustment that you're making. And when you are recognizing that there is a diverse set of identities and perspectives in the room, you're going to get stuff wrong. And that's okay. That's fine. That's, that's okay. And it's, it's good to learn and grow. The one thing that I do recommend is to not put the guilt of getting something wrong on the neurodivergent people. <laughs> Don't make people, you know, have to sit and listen to you apologize 18 times for the thing that you did wrong. Just walk away, process emotions, come back when you are ready and engage in a, in a more productive manner. Um, it's a lot of emotional burden to, to, and just energy to have to not only do my own stuff, but also listen to other people um, then, you know, feel terrible about the mistakes that they have made. We are all going to make mistakes and that is totally okay and natural. And it is a part of growth. It is a part of learning and um, yeah, process that as you will. Fantastic input. You're right. 
Christine, we are running out of time and I do want to get the opportunity to talk about resources. I, I warned the panelists going into this, I, I said, I think we probably won't get through all these questions. Um, and you guys did a great job, or you all did a good job <laughs> on that. So uh, the other questions, and we're not going to go over them, but I'll read them um, about how can managers and colleagues help create the neurodiversity friendly, friendly workplace. And I think that was covered really well already. Um, and then there was a point from Lucas about how we can create environments where people are seen, heard, and respected. That was all also touched on um, by Ian and Lucas and the other panelists uh, when they said to come in without bias and, and be a listener. And I think there was some threads of always assuming positive intent too there. Like nobody's out there trying to upset you or hurt you. It really is some people are dealing with whatever they are dealing with on that day. Before we wrap up, I do want to talk about what resources are available at the UW or in the community. And, and this may not be a complete, this is definitely not going to be a complete list, but if we could go over a few today from each of the panelists, maybe one or two from each panelist, that'd be great. Ian, do you want to start? Yeah, sure, I'll start. And I'm, I apologize, I can't keep it to one or two, so I'm going to do four really quickly. Um, number one um, is the employment accommodations process. The university has a formalized process for coming in, working with employees and managers in order to determine if, you know, adjustments need to be made that would um, assist someone in being effective in the workplace. Um, so uh, there is that. You can find more information about that at the Disability Services Office web website. Uh, as well, um, uh, CareLink. Um, the employee assistance program. If if someone ever is, you know, experiencing, um, you know, uh, difficulties in the workplace, you know, um, uh, and feels like they would need to to maybe talk to someone, you know, that's not a supervisor, that's not a colleague. EAS, uh, the CareLink program, can be um, a very helpful resource. Outside of the university, two quick um, uh, resources. One is the Department of Vocational Rehabilitation. They are able to provide funding at times for um, different services, coaching, um, you know, uh, those types of services. They can assist with purchasing um, technology um, for individuals. Uh, and then the, the last one is the Job Accommodation Network, which is a great place if you're wondering, you know, gosh, what, what, can, I, what can I do personally uh, or as a manager, what can I do to, uh, uh, you know, assist someone um, in, in the workplace, um, the Job Accommodation Network is just a large federally funded um, resource that has a number of different accommodations. Thank you, Ian. Um, Christine, do you have a couple of, of resources? I um, have been staring at this chat for a while and it's extremely hard for me to hear and read things at the same time. So. Um, we're talking about resources. The only thing that I have in my head currently is what I put in the chat, which is not a formal resource, um, but will hopefully be soon. There's a couple of neurodivergent and uh, disabled staff members who are trying to put together a UW affinity group for um, neurodivergent disabled folks trying to figure out if those are together or if we want separate groups, whatever that will look like. Um, but if you're interested in that, please, please email me and I will put my email in the chat again for anybody who is interested. Um, there's a ton of other things, but I'm most I want to focus on for those of you who do identify as neurodivergent um, and or mentally ill, mad and or disabled um, that you have community because that is I think the one thing that made the most impact for me. Thank you, Christine. Kels, do you have any resources? Oh, sorry, Ashley, go ahead. I was just going to throw out there. Uh, you can also check out the disability pride swag stories of Crip Riot, which is an organization uh, started by disabled and deaf alum from the UW. And I put the link in chat, it's cripriot.com. Great. Tells. Um, I have, uh, oh, sorry, Lucas, do you wanna go first? Yeah, mine's just just real quick. I saw that we, in the chat, that we had a lot of people who were self-diagnosed. And so um, I want to plug my webinar that we will send around, which is for people who are self-diagnosed talking about helping you think about, do you want an evaluation? And if not, or you can't get one, what resources are available to you without a formal autism diagnosis? I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, 
These two I'm going to recommend for everybody, but especially for faculty um, or TAs or anyone who is interacting with students directly. Um, the There are two books. One is Divergent Mind by Janera Neppenberg. Uh, and the second is the dyslexic advantage, the dyslexic advantage. Um, so both are available in audiobook format uh, and for free through libraries if you have Overdrive or the Libby app. Um, and uh, Divergent Mind is specifically about how Divergent Mind was the first title. Um, and it's specifically about how uh, women and femmes are specifically underdiagnosed and ways that um, that neurodivergency can show up differently in in different folks and it's it's incredibly well written it's one of the first research books of its time um, and the dyslexic advantage is the second one that's how I learned that there are four different types of dyslexia and how they kind of um, interact with one another and um, just for anybody who is teaching out there, or if you're just teaching people on your team how to learn new computer systems, right? If you're teaching anybody how to do anything, oftentimes what can seem like disruptive behavior to a neurotypical person is actually just the way we learn. <laughs> Um, so it can be interrupting and jumping ahead because our brains are making different connections. Um, and, or it can be like, I'm having trouble following. Can you tell me what finished looks like? And can we work our way backwards, right? Kind of like Lucas was saying earlier, sometimes just how we approach things is different. But um, if you have ever had that moment where you're like, I was building up to this and you just totally stole my thunder and you're kind of looking at somebody or they're just they're like why are we focusing so much on this one thing we're trying to move on from this it's, it's probably because their brain can't move on until they understand that thing better um and so as a student who has to walk into multiple different classrooms on any given day quarter what have you and navigate these accommodations versus how a professor prefers to teach um it is really daunting and really, really hard. So even just understanding the ways that these things can look different, I think can help really build a lot of compassion and understanding in building more neurodiverse friendly classrooms as well. What a beautiful way to conclude this event. Thank you, Kels. We are over time. This has been a huge learning experience for me. I can speak for myself and hopefully for the rest of the folks that joined us today. Thank you so much panelists for being here. Thank you attendees for being here at this event today and hanging out with us for a few extra minutes over the event time. Um, we will copy your questions from the chat and we'll follow up with an email and a recording. Once again, thank you all so much and a big thank you to our panelists.